Last time I talked to you about a verse from John's Gospel, John chapter 1 and verse 29, where John makes this amazing declaration. Behold, John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And last time I said to you that the important thing for us to note there was that when John was talking about sin as opposed to sins, he was talking about the root and not simply the fruit. Not the fruit alone, which is sins, but the root, the absolute cause of the problem, sin. And here we have the Lamb of God who take away the sin of the world. And I asked you the question last time, what did you think, what, how do you see God? What's your understanding of who God is and what he's like? Because what I want to suggest to you this time was that we needed to think not only about the nature of God and the kind of God we worship, but the nature of sin and the kind of problem it was and the kind of solution that it required. If you've been raised in traditional evangelical circles, I guess your understanding of the gospel is something like this. Uh, Jesus was punished for the sins of the world. In other words, there was a problem called sin. Somebody had to pay the price. We were guilty, but we couldn't pay the price. But the great incredible act of Christ is that he comes and he pays our price. So the, the logic works something like this. Sin is a legal problem because it's a legal problem and it's a crime, it deserves a punishment. So Jesus takes the punishment for us and Jesus thus becomes the penal substitute. So the great doctrine of penal substitution has gone out and that's pretty well what we understand. Now, what we take from that is that because Jesus died on the cross, the anger of God is appeased. And to take you back to a word we've discussed in our last uh, episode, Jesus then becomes the propitiation. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm left with a few question marks around that. Because the, part, the puzzle for me and the difficulty for me with that narrative is this. I can see in that, in that construction how I could certainly find myself absolutely at ease to be in the presence of Jesus. After all, Jesus, if you will, was the one that died for me, so why wouldn't I want, to, why wouldn't I want him to be with me? I can even see how I'd be at peace with the Spirit, and that I'd be happy to engage and relate through the, through the medium of the Spirit, no problem at all. But I'm left a bit of a question mark, a bit of a shadow, if you like, over the nature of God. Because I'm thinking to myself, okay, Jesus died for my sins, and that's fantastic. But why did somebody have to get killed? Why was the price that had to be paid for my sin death? What, what was that about? Now, I understand the nature of the problem. I understand the problem was congenital. But what I'm worried about, what I'm disturbed about, is that is there a punitive side of God? Is there something about God that required, in order for him to be, des for his desires to be met, that somebody needed to be punished? Now that seems to me a little bit of a problem, and it seems to me a problem because it seems to go against what I know to be sure about the nature of God. And that left me, over the years, feeling a little uncomfortable, if I'll be honest with you, with the, the basic standard received theology. And I was looking for something that seemed to me to be a little bit more consistent. What I'm really troubled about is, even in the British penal system, everybody will tell you the goal of punishment is rehabilitation. There's no point punishing someone for the sake of revenge. What you punish for, if you believe in punishment in that sense, is for rehabilitation, restoration. So I'm left with that essentially godless punitive system that recognizes that the goal of punishment is to rehabilitate, but yet I'm left with a doctrine, a theology that says, now the goal of punishment is to punish, uh, and that seems to me rather strange. So there is another way to approach this particular problem, and that's to say, instead of sin being a legal problem, sin is a congenital problem. Sin is a, uh, it's a, it's a man problem. It's, it's, it's effectively, instead of sin being a crime, sin becomes a sickness. Now that's very helpful, because if sin's a crime, then I understand that it requires punishing. On the other hand, if sin is a sickness, then it doesn't need punishing, it needs healing, it needs a cure. Now that 
potentially opens the door to what seems to me a much more consistent sense of understanding who God is. Because in my other paradigm, I'm left with a Jesus I can deal with, a Holy Spirit that I can deal with, but a Father that I'm, a, if I'm honest with you, I'm a little bit wary of because, well, you know what, if he's prepared to take Jesus out, ugh, that leaves me with a few problems. I recognize that he took Jesus out because he loves me, but I'm still, I'm still scratching my head a little bit around that. But if sin is a sickness, and sickness requires a healing, then Jesus, instead of becoming the penal substitute, could potentially be something much more wonderful. He might be, instead of the penal substitute, he might be instead the donor. See, because what I'm wondering is this. Let's imagine that what we're actually talking about here is a heart disease, a heart disease. Man's heart is, is made of stone, we learn. But the promise of the scripture is that we'll be given a new heart, a heart of flesh. And upon that heart, the Lord will write, our, write his laws. And I wonder if it could actually be this, that what God saw throughout all eternity past was man had a broken heart, man had a heart condition, man had a heart that was damaged and hardened and calloused by the fall, no longer able to pump the very lifeblood of the Spirit, no longer able to engage with God, no, no longer able to move out in community with God, hardened, withdrawn and turned in on itself, unable to, to function properly, unable to reach out from itself into community. And so here is God caught with the very huge, the, the, the divine problem. The divine problem is all of his succeeding generation, all of mankind, the world that he loves so much, was now languishing, was now doomed in this alienation, this alienation, this enforced alienation that was enforced simply because of the inner man's inability to connect heart to heart with God. And so what the Lord did in order to solve that problem was gave his only begotten son, his only son, for God so loved the world, well here in John chapter 3. It wasn't that so God, God so loathed the world, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And what did he give his only begotten son to do? He gave his only begotten son as the donor, as the heart donor. So what happened was Jesus stood up and said in the divine assembly, here I am, send me. And he gave his heart, and into us was placed the heart of Jesus. And because we have the heart of God in us, we have a heart for God, and we have a heart for the things of God. And now it seems to me a much more consistent picture that the Father has indeed been propitiated, that the desire of the Father has been met, that the heart of God now rests within all men. And yet in this, if you will, in this mysterious uh, sleep in which man had fallen into, it was as though... Uh, and forgive me for this fantasy, if you will, but it was as though what had happened to man, and perhaps the clearest picture that I can see of the, of the story of restoration, is that man is a little like sleeping beauty that had pricked themselves on a spindle of good works and fallen into a deep sleep. And in that deep sleep, it began to live out the nightmare of separation. It began to live out the nightmare of religion. It began to carve for itself and fashion for itself this perverted sense of God. But yet, through mercy and grace and the wonder of the gospel, Jesus Christ himself it descends from heaven, comes down into all our estrangement, comes down into all our confusion, and climbs the very Tower of Babel that is our religious mind, and kisses us. And with the kiss of grace, we come alive and awake to the things of God. And once again, now with this new heart restored within us, this new heart that's been given into us, we now start to breathe the life of Christ, and once again can begin to communicate with God, once again to, can begin to come into communion with God. And so here we were, languishing our estrangement, cut off from God by the illusion that is caused, or caused by the, the hardness of our hearts, unable to communicate with God. But Jesus Christ is the solution to that heart condition. And he, who knew no sin, gave himself, became sin, in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So my friend, think of it like this. Instead of thinking of salvation, of the need for salvation being to deal with the punishment for sin, think of it as being the cure for the sickness of sin. God bless you.